imagine if each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing you are happy even while you're dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. I'm Emily Zerothret, welcoming you to explore with me your life of endless possibilities. Aloha. I am so happy that you're joining us here today on our podcast. And I have a a wonderful guest for you that you're going to enjoy this conversation. He's got a lot to talk about. He's written a beautiful book that really touched my heart. And I know that you'll want to know about it, too. So this is uh, Nick or Nicholas. What do you prefer? I go by Nick. Uh, Nicholas, if I'm in trouble. So Nick. Oh, Nick okay. Uh, <laughs> Nick Shaw is here to join us today. Nick, can you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah. Well, first off, very happy to be here. So thank you for for letting me talk to, to you and, and to your audience. Let's see. So I, I live in Massachusetts, so very far from where, where Emily, you are right now, uh, several, several time zones away. I'm an executive coach by, and that's my profession. Um, and so I, I do a lot of work with leaders, trying to help them be better leaders, which is kind of why why I do that work. And I guess the reason I'm here today is is almost five years ago now, I lost my my oldest son William. Uh, he was uh, nine years old, and while we were out in, in on vacation uh, skiing in Montana, he died in a, in a freak and tragic ski accident. And obviously, the worst possible thing that can happen to a parent is to is to lose a child. And through many, many hours of processing and 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 going through my own experience of grief, uh, I decided I want to share all my learnings with the world and decided to write a book called My Teacher, My Son. And and um, that's kind of been the focus of my work over the past couple of years to really try to bring those concepts to life and again share it with the world. So so happy to share that with with this audience as well. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad you're here to do that. And I I love that concept. When I first heard your title, I thought that that's really beautiful that you can see from his his young life all the there's something in the innocence of children that they're they're not jaded like we can get to be as we get older. And when we really pay attention to their their thoughts and their their actions, we can see a lot of beauty there. And I I felt that when I was reading your book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um. And, and it's interesting. I was, I'd say it's probably a couple of weeks after William died, we were back home and uh, I was reflecting on him and who he was and, and the impact he'd had on me. And, and I realized he'd been teaching me since the day he was born. Cause when he was born, I was, you know, his birth prompted me to switch careers because I was in a career I wasn't happy with. And I becoming a father to a son, inspired me to look for something that I was passionate about because I, I had this very strong sense that I need to role model for him on, on how to be. And I didn't want to role model that I was doing something that I wasn't even remotely interested in. So that was the first lesson he taught me. And then, he, you know, as you said, watching and observing kids, there's so much they can teach us if we're open to it, if we pay attention. Um, and so many, many things he did um, in his life taught me amazing lessons. And then, and then obviously experiencing his death was yet another place of learning for me. Oh, I I can't imagine losing a child so young and it was so so instant. It's like he was yeah. there and then he wasn't. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's literally what happened. He was he was there one second and then the next he wasn't and and it and it um that kind of shock at least for me and it 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 really just just showed how fragile life really can be. William was literally here one minute and, and gone the next. And, and, you know, after, after the accident, that's something I, I really reflected on quite a bit. Cause, cause really for me, it really just showed me the fragility of life. You know, when you lose your child, you, you confront mortality at, at a, in, a, in a very extreme way. I mean, we, we all, it's all something we will face we will all face that someday, but we, we tend to sort of push it to the side conveniently. But when you lose your child, you have, there, there's no other option but to look that in the face. And, and, and losing William so suddenly just, just showed to me just we got to make the best of this one life we have. And, and that's where I really started to do a lot of reflecting on how I could live my life differently. 
That's that's beautiful. And in at that point, you changed your job too. Did you? Was that what happened? I, I took a so after he died, I was I was I had already transitioned careers and to become an executive coach, and was doing you know love the work and continue. I still do that today. But you know, after he died, I had to pull myself out for for a little bit because I was you know as an executive coach, my job is to engage and listen to people and help them work through whatever they need to work through. And I was in no state to do that. So I, I needed to step away and, and just, yeah, just take a pause. And you actually had a chance to do that. It was about six months. Is that right? That you were away from work? Yeah, I was fortunate. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I feel really blessed that I was able to do that. I, don't, I, I know a lot of people don't have an opportunity to do that when they face uh, loss. And I was lucky. I, I, was able to step away. Uh, my my partners in my firm were more than willing to help me out uh, through that, and it was critical to to my healing process, to, to not only my healing process but to our family's healing process. That's so wonderful. So many people. Um, oh, I remember one person telling me that they had to go back to work three days after the funeral. And when they got back, she got a little weepy on her first day back at one point and her boss came over and he said, aren't you over that yet? Oh, yeah. But people just don't understand. No, they don't. And it's, it's, uh, that's, 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 well, that's, um, that's, that's a terrible story. I mean, that's, that's awful. Right. And, and uh, it, it is unfortunate when things like that happen. And I think often that happens is because people just aren't able to, to empathize and, and, and put themselves in the other person's shoes. And that that's that's unfortunate that had to happen to that to your friend. Yeah, and and I I think that's just it too. It's the people who haven't dealt with a loss yet. We're all going to be going dealing with lots of losses throughout yeah. our lives, and the, the people that don't experience them earlier on I just don't really have a clue until it's actually happened around them or to them, somebody close to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, there's only one way to to learn about loss and it's to experience loss. Um, That's right. But you, you've turned it around by, I think, writing this book must have been really therapeutic for you to really help you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it, it, it was extremely therapeutic and it actually continues to be therapeutic, um, um, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I, I've been reflecting a lot on the journey of writing this book and it, and it really has helped me to confront some things that I conveniently pushed away before the accident and, and, and really figure out how I can overcome some of my own insecurities and let go of some of the chatter and noise in my head that tends to hold me back. Because again, we're, we're, we're not here for that long. And, and it's, it's just not, no one should have to live that way. We should be able to, you know, live meaningful, fulfilling lives and, and, um, and yeah, so the writing this book has really helped me to 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 push through some of those things. What advice would you give to somebody that you meet that has recently lost a child? And I excuse me, I shouldn't have said lost. I I try not to do that. Who've had a child who died? Well, I, th I think first and foremost, I would say you, you just got to give it the time it's going to take, and I think that's going to be different for everybody. I think another thing is you have to just let your grief unfold however it unfolds. Um, I can distinctly remember when I was going through my my grief process where there were so many times I felt like I was doing it wrong because, you know, you, you get all these books from your friends and loved ones and it, they mean well, but, you know, all the books on grief tend to lay it out as a very linear, smooth process. And And I remember thinking, I'm not going through it that way. So what the hell is wrong with me? Or I'm not overly emotional or, or crying every day or whatever. Right. And, and, um, it was only actually, I'd say probably midway through writing this book where I realized my process of grief was my process of grief. And, and that, what that entailed was going into a deeply reflective place, meditating, journaling. That was my way of doing it. And I, and I think for anybody, whether it's, it's, you know, the death of a child or death of a loved one in general, it's just do it your own way. And don't, don't let, let that be. I think that's that's number one. The other thing I would say is, you know, losing a child is such a destabilizing thing because it's not the, our brains can't wrap our heads around the fact that our child dies before us. It's just not the natural order of things. And so you will go to some pretty dark places just because of the sheer 
chaos that it that creates in your world. You 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 feel an utter loss of control because again, as a parent, your job is to try to protect your child, and you will obviously ask yourself those questions: What could you have done differently? And and that's I think just the natural process of things. But as dark as it may get, you know, one of the things that really helped me is as I came up with this mantra: uh, What would Willie want? What would Willie want for me for our family? And I, and I started to realize that, I, you know, I, I needed to choose to live my life and go through this process in a way that would honor his. Because anyone who, any loved one who passes, they don't want you to be in this deep state of grief forever. I mean, it's a normal process we all have to go through, but at some point they would want you to move forward. And so that was, that was another one, another really helpful thing for me is, you know, I, I needed to figure out how to live my life in a way that would honor his. And I would, I would, I would say that is, just as we want the best for our children, they want the best for us. And right. And so that, that is a, a, I guess, a useful framing for me that I would offer to anybody who loses a child. Oh, then that's so good. I, I really like that. And it, it's, it's somebody needs to be able to tell anybody that's in that situation. It's, it's okay to do whatever you need to do. Your grief is your grief. And, and that's, that's what is going to serve you best, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is, uh, I've done uh, quite a few podcasts already, and I've I've seen with the people that I've spoken to when they they have dealt with loss. Everybody's story is different. Mm-hmm. It's it's really totally different. And I've read lots of uh, books that have to do with grief. Uh, a lot of them they say that they wrote it to help somebody else. And I, when you read it, you you can see that that, that wasn't it at all. <laughs> they were writing their story because they needed to say it and they, they needed to to put their words down. And I'm glad that they did. I don't begrudge them that at all. I'm not criticizing that. But they feel like they're writing it to help other people. But it's it's so nice to see the different perspectives. When I was reading things, I thought, oh, I could look at that subject differently, or I I never thought of that. I could try that, you know, that sort of thing as I was going through. I, I wasn't finding one place that had it all. I think that's why I, I read so many different kinds of books. And that kind of speaks to what we were talking about, that everybody's grief is different. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, you, you have to find your way. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, that's, I think that's the best way. The, the other thing I would say with with grief is the only way through is through. Mm-hmm. You can't avoid it. Uh, you can't avoid the pain. Um, you gotta. You have to. And, and I and I say that also acknowledging that initially our natural reaction will be to try to avoid it because it's it's extremely painful. But there comes a point where you have to go through it because if you don't, it, you'll never you'll never get to the to a place where you can find grief and happiness. That's right. And self-care is such a big part of that. A lot of people really suffer with lack of self-care and mm-hmm. early grief because they just aren't thinking about self-care. Yeah. They just a lot of times feel like they're kind of in a void and eating's hard or they eat too much or they don't want to bathe. They don't want to do anything but lie in bed. Maybe have the TV on, maybe not. Yeah. And I think that's okay for a while if that's what you need to do. But I think it's also important not to do that for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And believe me, I had those moments. And um, I, I remember, well, there's a, a specific story, which I talk about in my book, where I was literally on my bed and just couldn't get up because I was so lethargic from you know being overly grief stricken and depressed. And and I just, I couldn't move and I didn't want to move. Like it was, it was like, I could have stayed there forever. And then my phone, somebody texted me on my phone and it, you know, kind of woke, I woke up the phone and and on, on the phone was a picture of my, my, my second son, Kai, who at the time William died was six. And and it was this picture of him on the phone. And, and, you know, he has these big eyes. He's always had big eyes since the day he was born. And he was had this look in his eyes and just said, "Don't, don't you dare forget about me. I might be the little brother, but don't forget about me." And 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 in that moment, it was sort of a slap in the face, like "Get up, like you got to get up for him." Um, and my wife and I talked a lot about that. We said, "God, thank God we have him, right?" And I couldn't have imagined that happening to to us had William been an only child. Um, and he was, 
he was our motivation. He was our inspiration to keep going. But I can I can relate to that feeling of just throwing in the towel, you know, just not wanting to get up. It, it's very common, really, yeah. really common. And it's it's also the sort of thing that I don't know if people feel embarrassed about it or they just don't want to share it. They don't want people to know that that's what they're doing or what they did. Mm-hmm. And by not admitting to having that sort of experience, it's not helping anybody. Because if, if you say, you know, it's it's okay if you don't feel like getting out of bed, you know, if, yeah. if that's how you're feeling that way that day, stay in bed. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think there is a, there is this this need or notion that you yeah you, you just have to accept that if that's where you are today that's where you are today. I mean, yes, there comes a point where at some point you do have to move forward, but in those early days, absolutely. I mean, even early days, early months, not even just early day, early weeks, early months. Like it, it's got that's how it's going to be for a bit, and that's just a normal part of the process for some, and that's totally fine. But that's a hard thing to get to. It's a hard thing to to get to that place. It's easier looking at it in hindsight, but. <laughs> Yeah, it's a hard thing to realize when you're there. I think those of us who have gone before, whoever we're referring to at this point, uh, it's it's really nice if we can kind of lead by example to show that that we can we can be happy now. It's not disrespectful to be happy. Absolutely, and it's it's fine to be happy. It's fine to love. I, I just I swore that I would never get married again, that I wasn't interested in ever going out on a date or ever meeting anybody under any circumstances because I had a, a wonderful marriage for 22 years. And I thought, OK, I did that and I'm going to honor my husband by just keeping it that way. And I was really shocked in that when that wasn't the way my life turned out because I, yeah. I thought I would made my mind up. But I was easy enough on myself to be able to let love in again. And I'm so glad I did. I think it's a really important part of, of the grief process to, to to let love in again, because we need that in our lives to to thrive and be happy. And and I kind of a, a sort of similar story to to what you're talking about in, in in my own experience. You know, after William died, you know, a common question that people asked us was, "Are you going to have another child?" And you know, when, when William died, I was you know I was 43. You know, I, I you know it's not like I was past that stage of life. Or I thought, but we decided to have another child, and and mad, you know, thankfully, and uh, you know, we we were able to have another child, um, and and we, you know, our our third son Bodie was born a year and a half after after William died, not to replace him, but we we needed we needed to feel more in balance. When when William died, our our you know, we were a family of four that became a family of three. There, it was it was we were totally off kilter as a family. And so we needed to find a way to bring balance into our lives, uh, and, and and gosh, most importantly, we needed we we wanted to provide our our, our now middle son Kai with a with another sibling, and so yeah, we 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 chose love, and and that's what caused Bodhi to to join us. That's a beautiful way to put it. That you chose love. I love that. Wow. Um, it's it's so wonderful that you've written this book. I admire you greatly for. Why, how you've handled everything and come through it so well and and that you are an example for other people that that you can go through great loss and great tragedy and and still you still have your family you still have much love and it helps you keep everything in perspective i think if anything it makes you cherish them that much more absolutely yeah you know i think about this a lot and you probably every day, um, cause I think about William every day, but this is the life I have now. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I can't picture my life differently as weird as it is to say, I can't picture my, my life without this event, without, you know, the loss of William happening. It just, that's the, that's the, the lot we were given or however you want to frame it. And yeah, we we're just doing what he would have wanted. Right. Which is to, to move forward, to, to honor him in that way. Yes. Wow. Thank you so much for being my guest today. This has been such a, a positive conversation. The, the light that comes when we allow to, ourselves to take care of ourselves and, and that leads to taking care of the people around us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, th- thank you. It's been, it's been great. Uh, 
well, chatting and getting to know you and, and, uh, and hopefully um, this will help others who are, you know, facing similar uh, situations, you know, if they can, if they can help just one person, one family, then, then, you know, that's why I wrote the book. And that's why I like doing these types of podcasts. That's great. So we'll have all the links in our notes after the podcast here so that you can get in touch with Nick and so that you can get a copy of his book and read it because it's it's a beautiful book. It's a, a beautiful love story. And I, I think you'll really enjoy reading that. So I appreciate you being here and I appreciate our listeners and we'll see you next week. Aloha. Do you want more comfort, support, and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance. Visit my website at lovingandlivingyourwaythroughgrief.com and read my book, Loving and Living Your Way Through Grief. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge on all our episodes on grief and happiness. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode.